I am Ramit Lamba. I am director of CT at UC Davis Medical Center. I have no disclosures. In this presentation, I'm going to discuss opportunities for dose reduction and all the different steps of a CT guided interventional procedure as listed on this slide. There are a variety of procedures in the abdomen that require image guidance. These include biopsy, fluid aspiration, drainage of fluid collections, ablation of tumors, which can be done using both heating and freezing of tissues and injection of therapeutic agents into cysts or for nerve blocks. Seven Secrets books seem to be immensely popular among most readers, so I decided to model my talk along the same theme and provide seven tips for reducing those while performing interventional procedures under CT guidance. My first tip is to try and see if the procedure can be done with ultrasound guidance. In this case, there would be no radiation dose to the patient. Biopsies that are predominantly done using CT guidance include adrenal nodules, retroperitoneal masses, pancreatic tail masses, about 50% of renal masses in our practice, and biopsies of lung nodules. Also, in patients that are obese, CT is preferred for guidance since it provides better visualization compared with ultrasound. Fluid collections that are drained or aspirated using CT guidance include collections that contain air, collections that are around the pancreas, collections that are deep in the abdomen or pelvis, or collections that have bowel loops in the close vicinity of the collection. In addition, drainage of a lung abscess or pneumothorax is also done using CT guidance. Ultrasound is predominantly used for biopsies of liver masses and about 50% of renal masses in our practice. Target lesions are much more easy to identify in thin patients, which makes ultrasound a desirable modality for interventional procedures in thin patients. Masses in the pancreatic head are usually biopsied using endoscopic ultrasound guidance. In patients who have difficulty holding their breath, ultrasound is more preferable to CT since in these patients multiple CT sequences may need to be obtained to achieve the desired needle placement resulting in dose accumulation in a limited region. Foot collections that are drained or aspirated using ultrasound guidance include those in the liver or kidney, tubal ovarian abscesses, or collections in the cul-de-sac. Additional cholecystostomy tubes for acute cholecystitis are placed under ultrasound guidance, and ultrasound guidance can also be used for collections that are superficial or subcutaneous and don't contain air. This 59-year-old patient has an infiltrating mass in the right kidney. Additionally, multiple masses are present in the liver. In this patient, the lesion was very well seen at ultrasound, and the preferred guidance modality should be ultrasound, as was used for this patient. The next patient has an incidentally detected enhancing mass in the left kidney, very well visualized with ultrasound. Given good ultrasound visualization, biopsy of this mass was performed using ultrasound guidance. As mentioned before, about 50% of renal masses in our practice are biopsied using CT guidance and the remaining 50% with ultrasound guidance. The decision is generally made on a case-by-case -case basis. This is a 33-year-old diabetic male, and she T showed a large abscess in the right lobe of the liver. This is easily visualized and accessible by ultrasound. Hence, drainage of this abscess was performed with ultrasound guidance. This is a 29-year-old pregnant woman who presented with acute cholecystitis. Given her advanced pregnancy, surgery was deferred and a cholecystostomy tube was placed into the gallbladder under ultrasound guidance. In this slide, I summarize the structure of a CT-guided interventional procedure. Initially, a localizing scan is obtained to localize the lesion that is being targeted. Multiple sequential CT scans then need to be obtained during the course of the procedure, both with the needle being placed into the target and finally to confirm the needle tip in the lesion.
At the end of the procedure, a CT is performed to check for any complications. It is important to emphasize that each of these steps offers an opportunity for dose reduction. Interventional CT procedures entail repetitive radiation to a limited anatomic territory, and this accumulates over the course of the procedure. Also, for the most, protocols for these procedures are loosely defined, and not many departments have well-defined protocols for interventional CT procedures. There is a tendency to use the default scanner settings that are used for diagnostic imaging while performing interventional procedures, and this can result in very high doses to a limited territory. There needs to be strong communication with the team, chiefly the technologist, so that they understand what technical factors are needed at each step of the procedure. Images performed at low dose are inherently noisy and there is both an inherent discomfort among radiologists with noisy images in addition to the perception that the lesion may not be seen at low doses. This may be only occasionally true when dealing with low contrast lesions that are small in size on unenhanced CT. And finally, if the patient is not breathing consistently, it could result in several acquisitions to achieve accurate needle placement within the lesion. In this example of a drain that was placed into a right source abscess, the procedure was done using the default scanner protocols. No attention was paid to dose reduction for either the localizing scan during needle placement or for the post-procedure scan. All images acquired for the scan were done at the same dose at a reasonably high MAS, and the total DOP for this procedure translates to an effective dose of 10 millisievert, and this is important to point out that this dose has been delivered over a very small anatomic territory. The next, and in my opinion, the biggest opportunity for dose reduction is to minimize the extent of the localizing scan. This is a 60-year-old male with transitional cell carcinoma of the urinary bladder. CT images show a 7 millimeter left paraaortic lymph node that was new from the prior exam and a biopsy of this lymph node was requested. A careful review of the images localized this image to the L23 disk space. We determined that this lymph node would certainly be included on the images if we obtained a limited territory scan from the middle of L1 to the top of the iliac crest. The scan length was only 6.3 centimeters and that combined with the low-dose acquisition resulted in a DLP of only 59 for the localizing scan. The third tip is to decrease the dose of the localizing scan, and based on our experience, we have determined that the dose can easily be decreased by 50 to 60 percent compared to the diagnostic scan, and in our experience, this does not affect visualization of the target lesion. In the same patient as was shown on the prior example, a diagnostic CT urogram had been performed. The unenhanced and combined nephrographic and excretory phase images were acquired in an MAS of 320. We obtained a localizing scan at about a 72% decreased radiation dose compared to the diagnostic scan. An MAS of 90 in this case was adequate for visualization of the lymph node adjacent to the aorta. The CTDI in this patient dropped from approximately 22 on the diagnostic scan to 6 on the localizing scans. In this slide, I review the CT factors that affect the radiation dose. A decrease in the tube current, tube potential, gantry rotation time, scan length, and number of scan phases will decrease the radiation dose and an increase in the pitch and beam collimation will decrease radiation dose. In addition, radiation dose can be indirectly reduced by decreasing the image noise, which can be decreased by using soft reconstruction filters or iterative reconstruction techniques, and also by increasing the slice thickness. For lesion localization scans, there are several strategies that can be used to decrease dose. 
Most importantly, almost all procedures are preceded by a diagnostic scan and it is important to review the diagnostic scan carefully and identify bony landmarks which will allow you to prescribe a limited region localizing scan and the time of the interventional procedure. Of all of the factors that are showed in the previous slide that affect the radiation dose, we find that the simplest factor to decrease the radiation dose during an interventional procedure is to manipulate the MA since the dose response when decreasing the MA is linear and easy to predict. Further, you can use calcifications of adjacent vascular structures or within a lesion or around the lesion as a guide for lesion localization when images get noisy as the MAS is decreased. Finally, good communication with the team and the technologist is important to accomplish the optimal radiation dose for the localizing scan and prevent the technologist from using default scanner protocols that are in place for diagnostic scans. Here are a few strategies that I would recommend for choosing the optimal dose for the localizing scan. Most importantly, in my opinion, I recommend turning automated dose modulation off. Since the diagnostic CT almost always precedes an interventional scan, an estimate of the dose can be obtained from the diagnostic CT. An easy rule of thumb is to decrease the MA by 50% compared to the diagnostic scan. The dose can be decreased even by 70% depending on the situation. Here are some MA parameters that I recommend for CT guided interventional procedures and these are based on the abdominal diameter which should be measured on the AP scout. So even for larger patients that have an abdominal diameter exceeding 50 cm, I recommend not to use an MA as of greater than 125. An important and sometimes overlooked tip while performing a CT guided interventional procedure is to focus on how the patient is going to be breathing during the exam. I strongly recommend that breathing training should be done for all patients prior to the procedure. Studies have shown that Expiratory breath holds are more consistent over the course of the procedure than inspiratory breath holds. Communication with the technologist is again key. In order to avoid any mistakes during the exam, I also recommend turning auto voice commands off. Finally, I recommend completing the procedure in an expedited fashion since the consistency of breathing generally deteriorates over the course of time, especially in sedated patients. The ultimate success of an interventional guided CT procedure depends on accurate needle placement and it is important to achieve this with the minimal number of scans. In the next few slides, I will show you techniques on how to achieve optimal needle placement in the lesion. Prior to starting the procedure, it is important to identify the safest and most accessible path of the needle to the target. In order to avoid overscanning and repeat scans to localize the needle tip, it is important to achieve a perfect alignment of the needle in the XY plane, for which I strongly recommend the use of the outer scanner laser light. Also, in the majority of cases, the needle is angled from the perpendicular and the majority of radiologists use some guesswork to determine the angle of the needle. In the next few slides I will show you the use of an angle measuring app that is easily available on mobile devices which will help in improving the accuracy for angled needle placements. Finally, as a part of my technique, I use a fine 22 or 23 gauge guidance needle to establish the path to the target and subsequently I tandem a larger needle or a drainage catheter parallel to the guiding needle. At the time of the tandem technique, I generally do not use CT guidance. 
Here we are using the outer scanner light, which is about 12 inches outside of the gantry to help guide accurate needle placement in the XY plane. In the image on the left, the light is not intersecting the hub of the needle, but after a little adjustment, we are able to get the laser light to intersect the hub of the needle. This will result in perfect needle alignment in the XY plane. Here's another image of the laser light intersecting the hub of the needle, and this will result in perfect needle alignment in the XY plane. This is an app that is readily available on mobile devices. We find this app to be helpful when placing the needle at an angle. This needle uses the built-in camera of the phone to visualize the needle as it is being placed and superimposes a measuring device on the picture, which helps in determining the angle at which the needle is being placed. In this example, the needle needed to be placed at 11 degrees, and by positioning ourselves directly in line with the needle, we are able to determine the angle accurately using this mobile device app. Getting the needle in at the right angle will decrease repeated scans to get the correct angle. Tip number six is to perform the needle check scans at ultra-low doses, as will be discussed in the subsequent few slides. Ultra-low doses can be achieved by decreasing the MA factor by 25% compared to the localizing scan and using CT fluoroscopy. When additional needle check scans are performed, the MA can be sequentially decreased by an additional 25%. Again, the simplest factor to adjust is the MA given its linearity. Some suggested MA parameters based on the abdominal diameters are shown in this slide. When using CT fluoro, it is important to tap the pedal gently, fleetingly, and only once. In the same patient undergoing the left retroperitoneal lymph node biopsy, the laser light is used to achieve accurate needle placement in the XY plane as is seen on these images. This minimizes the number of needle check scans that are needed. Further, needle check scans in this patient were performed at a KVP of 120 and MAS of 30. The total fluoroscopy time used for needle check scans was a minuscule two seconds. The total effective dose from the entire procedure was 1.07 MSV, with 90% of the dose contribution from the initial localizing scan. Please note that all interventional CT procedures that we perform in our practice do not use iterative reconstruction since that is not currently available on our interventional scanners. If iterative reconstruction were to be available, then an additional 40 to 50 percent dose reduction can be applied to what is being shown in this presentation, resulting in some of our procedures potentially being less than one millisievert. In this example of a right adrenal biopsy, the diagnostic scan was obtained at 150 MAS. The first needle check scan was obtained at 100 MAS, and the subsequent scans that were required to confirm needle tip within the lesion were obtained at 60 MAS. Thus, by sequentially lowering the dose, we were able to decrease the CTDI wall from 5.1 for the diagnostic scan to 3.4 for the first needle check and 1.87 for the final needle check. Another example of an adrenal biopsy with the diagnostic scan obtained at 100 MAS and needle check scan obtained at 40 MAS based on what we perceived to be an adequate dose to visualize the needle approaching the target. In this example, where pelvic fluid collection is being drained using CT fluoroscopy guidance, ultra-low dose scans have been obtained both for guiding needle placement and subsequently to check the catheter position within the collection. Another example where a deep pelvic fluid collection is being aspirated with the diagnostic scan obtained at 180 MAS. 
Sequential lowering of dose was performed for the needle check scans which were obtained at 36 MAS and subsequently decreased to 24, 10, 15 and finally 9 MAS. The post-procedure scan done to check whether the entire fluid collection had been drained was performed at 6 MAS. Again, as is seen in this example, the majority of the dose contribution is from the initial diagnostic scan, and even though some of the needle check scans were performed at incredibly low doses, these were adequate for the purpose of the exam. Yet another example of sequential lowering of the dose, starting with 120 MAS for the diagnostic scan, dropping down to 10 MAS to check the needle within the target, and in this patient, we were able to achieve an incredibly low CTDI wall of 0.6 for the final needle check scan. One reason to use a helical mode in favor of CT fluoroscopy would be when the target is small and the patient is actively breathing, making localization of the needle tip challenging. And this was the reason why a helical approach was preferred in favor of CT fluoroscopy in this patient. I generally do not recommend using CT fluoroscopy for real-time needle placement because it results in longer exposure times. I use CT fluoroscopy only for intermittent needle check scans during the procedure. Typically, if we have a well-visualized target and the patient is cooperative throughout the procedure, we are able to complete the procedure in two to four seconds of fluoroscopy time. This slide shows the typical setup for CT fluoroscopy in the procedure room. We have two wall hanging monitors, one on each side of the room. A keypad is used to control the table position. A fixed joystick assists in moving the CT table. And fluoroscopy can be done using the foot pedal. A final question that needs to be asked is whether a post-procedure scan is necessary. Eliminating the post-procedure scan will result in additional dose savings. This is thus the last opportunity for dose reduction. The decision whether a post-procedure scan is needed really depends on what complication you are looking for. Are you checking for a pneumothorax after lung biopsy? Or are you trying to detect perihepatic or perirenal hemorrhage after a liver or renal biopsy? Does the intent and clinical judgment will dictate the quality of the post-procedure scan and a 40 to 50 percent dose reduction from the localizing scan is generally adequate for most clinical purposes. In this example of a chest tube placement for evacuating a pneumothorax, the catheter placement check scan was performed at a KVP of 140 and MAS of 6. The post-procedure scan was obtained to determine whether the pneumothorax had been completely evacuated, and this was performed at a low KVP of 80 and an ultra-low MAS of 6, resulting in an incredibly low CTDI wall of 0 0.11. Finally, I would like to leave you all with the important message that CT-guided procedures need not be performed at radiation doses as are seen in this case where a large lung mass in contact with the chest wall and a fairly direct approach is being targeted using an MAS of 336 and the total DLP for the procedure was 1043 with an effective radiation dose of 15.65 millisieverts delivered over a limited region of the chest. Thank you all for your time and attention.